for this opportunity to study your word again. We thank you for the counsels we have in your word on health. And Lord, we know you want us to experience the best possible health because we know it plays an important role in our relationship with you. So we ask that you would be with us once again through your Holy Spirit and guide us. You know what changes you may want to bring about in our life. And I pray that by your Spirit, you will give us the understanding we need to do that. And also the grace. In Christ's name. Amen. 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 Okay. Well, we'll get into lesson eight here. How many have the lesson filled out? Good. Okay. You don't have yours filled out, Ralph? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph knows me. We've been around a lot. I'm not picking on him. Well, not too bad anyway. <laughs> it's okay. I know. He's, he's a good guy. Okay. Uh, let's uh, get into it. And we're going to first, the first one is fasting and physical health. Then we move into some emotional health areas. And fasting. I don't know how you are. I found when I was younger it was easier to fast than when I've gotten older for whatever reason. But we're going to see some of the benefits of it and perhaps expand the meaning a little bit as we go through it. What did Ellen White say about fasting in counsels and diets and food? She says abstinence from food one or two days a week could be beneficial to health for some. I would always advise, um, be careful of any health conditions you have that could, you know, that's giving you a challenge. And I would always recommend check with your doctor before you try to proceed with fasting. I would also say uh, fasting, never fast from water. You want to be sure you get hydrated, especially here in the desert. Uh, and there's more than one way to fast, as we'll see through this lesson. How does good health play an important role in one's communication with God? Good health gives us a clearer mind for communication with God. We've seen that before. God communicates with us through our brain. And the more clear our mind is, uh, the better God can communicate with us. And Satan knows that because all you got to do is see what he's trying to do with the minds of people today in many different ways. How did Ellen White expand the traditional definition of fasting? She said abstaining, abstain from stimulating foods, use proper wholesome foods. So here's a, a bit of an expanded definition. Uh, you may choose uh, to cut out some desserts. That's a form of fasting. I know Ralph. <laughs> cut out everything else. Everything else but eat desserts. Oh, yeah, you so you can, you can do a little variety when it comes to your fasting um, and the stimulating foods, some that are not as good for us. So, you know, there's things we can do that will help uh, in our health in every area. Also, uh, describe the detoxification benefit of fasting. Eliminates or neutralizes poisonous substances by burning fat that stores toxins. Remember we spoke last time, uh, calories in versus calories burn up. And if we take more calories in than we burn up, then our body is efficient and it will, it will store those calories in fat stores. Um, so that if you come to a place someday where you're not getting enough calories, then it'll go reach in and take those fat stores to burn up. Uh, so you have the energy you need. Well, when it does that, uh, like it says here, it'll be eliminated, ne neutralizing some of the poisonous substances that's stored there. How does fasting promote healing of the body? Energy saved during fasting is used for metabolism and the immune system. That's why many times when you get sick, you feel tired. Well, that's your body's response. Your body needs energy to heal. And so you need rest. And so you're not consuming that energy that your body needs for healing. I'm sure all of us have had the experience. You got sick, 
you rested, you were getting better, but you got started too soon, and you had a setback, see that was it. You didn't get enough rest for the body really to fully heal on that. And when we fast, then again, we're conserving um, energy, and it does take energy to burn, you know, the calories, uh, it's, it's a combustion process, and so it can help metabolism and the immune system. Why does fasting seem to increase life expectancy? They, they've done uh, some tests with animals, as you know, on this. Um, slows metabolic, uh, metabolic rate, improve immune system, more efficient protein production, increased hormone production, and especially the anti-aging hormone. So there's, there's some benefits there. And by the way, you notice metabolism slows. This is the body, again, always trying to be in equilibrium. When you cut down calories, your metabolism will slow down. That's why if you're trying to diet, don't just cut down on calories, exercise. Because exercise will help speed up the metabolism. Uh, that's, that's important. List some other physical benefits of fasting. Improves rheumatoid arthritis, decreases allergic reactions such as hay fever, asthma, and helps reduce edema in lower body. Again, all of these are in the book, you know, and from studies that have been, that I quoted in the book. Why do you think those ready to meet Jesus when he returns will have been practicing fasting? Because they will want to have healthy bodies and clear minds for communion with God. Also, you know, it's interesting. Um, sometimes God uses situations to lead us into the lifestyle he wants. Remember, those who are ready to meet Jesus, they'll be going through a very difficult time. Some will be in prison. Some will be kind of in very rural settings. So I got a feeling we're not going to have all the luxuries that we may have now. And that in itself will play a role, I'm sure, in some of the dialogue that we follow at that time. So uh, it will play a role. But I don't want you to feel guilty if you're not able to fast. But there are some things we can do to benefit. Like I say, you may choose to cut out some desserts, or you may choose to eat one less meal or something. You know, there's things you can do, which is still falls in the category of fasting. Anything in this series, I've said it numerous times, I don't want this to be a series that puts a bunch of guilt on us. Do what you can. Get educated. It may reinforce some things you already know. It may give you some information you didn't know. And if out of this series, we make one or two lifestyle changes for the good, praise the Lord. That's a good thing. And we never change everything overnight. It's a process. That's just the way it is in life. And, and so we want to approach health the same way. Because I've heard people say, I'm going to follow health reform if it kills me. Um, that kind of goes against the whole purpose of health reform. If you're not enjoying it, it's not doing you a whole lot of good. Because you need to also have a positive attitude if you want to have good health. So I just keep in balance. Okay, now we're going to move to uh, the emotional factors of health. Uh, we'll look at three of the lessons on that, three of the days devotional is unemotional. First, praising God and health. The last 40-day book I wrote, just came off the press a few months ago, is on praising God. And so this is just one one day's devotional on praising God and health. What does God's Word teach about the benefit of praising God? Well, you know this text. It's good like a medicine. Good like a medicine. It um, puts the right chemicals in your body. You feel better mentally, emotionally, spiritually. You know, um, they made a movie of this, a TV movie, many, many years ago. I think there was a doctor who had cancer. Maybe you remember this? And he started watching a bunch of funny, I don't know, Laurel Hardy or whatever it was. 
and you're laughing. <laughs> and he got cured. <laughs> now, I don't say that's a universal cure for cancer, but it, it made a point that just like, you know, you know ecology and the, the environment we live in, in the world, it can be polluted or it can be healthy. Same in your body. You have an internal body ecology. And your body can either be polluted within, which is an environment conducive to disease, or we can have a uh, an environment within our body that's healthy, which is conducive to health. And praising God, having a praising attitude plays a role in having an environment in our body for good health. Now here is a study at University of California, Davis. Um, what they say about the benefit of a thankful attitude and physical health, it says it benefits one's cardiovascular system and immune system. And these are again proven yeah. health studies. What benefit of a positive attitude did uh, clinical psychologist Blair Justice, what did he find out? Um, let me read here. A lowers risk of, cardi of coronary <coughs> events. You know, a person can actually be scared to death. Yep. That's the extreme case of not being positive. So, you can show you the other way that if you are positive and have a positive attitude, that has a positive effect on our heart, um, blood pressure, and other things. What did Ella White say about the thankfulness, about thankfulness and health? She said it promotes health and prolongs life. What does God's warning in Deuteronomy teach about serving God with joyfulness? That's kind of an interesting verse. Uh, I think we'll take that. I'm not looking up as many as I usually do because we got a little bit of a late start. But Deuteronomy <coughs> chapter 28, 27 48. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart with the abundance of everything, therefore... You shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, nakedness, and need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. That's kind of strong, isn't it? But you know, <coughs> there's a text that says, God dwells in the midst of the praise of his people. So if we are having an attitude of praise to God, who are we inviting? God, holy angels. If we're grumbling and complaining, who are we inviting? Evil angels. We really are. And, yes? The individual you were thinking of was Norman Cousins. The one who started with the humor, looking at videos. Oh, he's the one? Norman yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Isn't it great with the technology we got? <laughs> in the hospital when he was diagnosed with cancer, he started watching funny movies and started yeah. laughing and, and they couldn't figure out why he was healing. Yeah, and the joy did it. Yeah. Well, right here it says, if we don't serve the Lord with joyfulness, we're not going to be blessed. So... It, there's a direct connection. Now, it isn't magic or anything. Again, it's a direct connection of who is with you and who isn't. And if we are praising God, we are inviting holy angels to be with us. Because when you read the book of Revelation, there's praise to God all the time. You read about heaven, there's some beings that just say, holy, 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 you know, praising God. And they're getting great joy and pleasure out of that. So it applies to us too. So it says they would be defeated by their enemies if they didn't serve God with gladness. What did David say about his practice of praising God? Uh, Psalm 34, 1. 
lot of praise in the Psalms. Psalm 34, 1. I preached my first sermon out of Psalm 34. And by the way, we're going to be covering deliverance, you know, miracles after Labor Day. Psalm 34 is a powerful deliverance psalm. Very powerful deliverance psalm when the enemy is attacking you. But we know it is Psalm 34, 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That is very, very important. And you've heard me say it many times. From the time you wake up in the morning, start praising God. We live in a great part of the world. Have you noticed these yellow bushes around our church? I drove in here the other day. I just started praising God. You know, God is beautiful, you know? That's a good thing to do. It lifts your, your spirits. So, yeah. And if you're feeling down, start praising God. Then turn it around. Amen. So, David said he's going to continually praise God. That's, that's the way it should be. When threatened with death, what did Daniel in his uh, prayer, what did he include in his prayer to God? And this was interesting. Daniel 6, um, verse 10 Remember, this is when uh, it had to do with the lion's den. He couldn't pray to anyone but the king, supposedly. But it didn't change Daniel's attitude of prayer. And notice, he opened his windows and he prayed. And he said, Now when Daniel knew the writing was signed, you got that? He didn't rush and have prayer before the writing was signed. It was signed now, and he's going to demonstrate he still trusts his God, and he'll be faithful to God no matter what. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open, <laughs> he didn't do it in secret, because this was his custom. Open the windows. Toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times a day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. If he had not opened those windows, even though he prayed, that would not have been an act of faith. They, you know, they would have been kind of hiding and they'd be thinking Daniel's going along with the king. But no. And even in this midst of crises, he gave thankfulness to God. <coughs> That's a good lesson for us. Amen. And it's hard to do sometimes. Sometimes it's purely, as I call it, pure naked faith. You don't see how you're going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. I told you the story. I got a letter from the IRS many years ago. Don't you just love those letters? Yeah. <laughs> letter from the IRS. They said I owed them thousands of dollars. And there was some document that I had signed many years before. I told them I did. They said, well, we don't have a record of it. I did sign it, I told them. We don't have a record of it. Well, I don't have a record of it. But when I got that letter, and this was hard to do, I raised it to God. And I said, thank you, Lord. This will be another testimony of praise of your faithfulness. Amen. That wasn't easy. <laughs> you know? And it took a while, it probably took a month or so, talking to this IRS, that IRS person, that IRS person, and I finally got a hold of some office, and I think I wrote a letter or something, and next thing you know, I got a whole mimeograph copy of that document I signed in the mail. That was in some file in the IRS office somewhere. And you know how government is. <laughs> But you know, I, I like to think of it, God, he, now I signed that back in about 72 or 71. And this was in 2000 something, many years later. But you know, I like to see God doing this. I signed that, sent it off where it's supposed to go. It got put in a file and God told an angel, keep an eye on it. He's not gonna keep a copy. He should keep a copy. He's not gonna keep a copy. <laughs> And he's going to want a copy someday. <coughs> so you keep an eye on it. Don't let it get lost. Hallelujah. And when the time came, there it was. 
That's the God we serve, folks. <laughs> That's why you can thank God, even like Daniel, when he's facing a challenging time. What difficult experiences did Paul list? Oh my, uh, this is amazing. 39 stripes five times. Imprisoned, beaten with rods three times. Stoned once, that's when they thought he was dead, remember? Stoned once, shipwrecked three times, threatened by robbers, hungry, thirsty, cold, naked, betrayed by false believers. I don't think any of us have quite had that rough of a journey. He did. Why was Paul able to maintain a positive attitude? Philippians 4. We get, get, we get discouraged over little things. Look what he fixed. Philippians 4, 11 13. <clears throat> Not that I speak in regard to me, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. Oh, that's a good lesson, isn't it? Whatever condition I'm in, whatever state I'm in, to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full, to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Good lesson. He knew his God well enough that he could trust God in all situations. <coughs> what did Paul and Silas do when they were in prison? Acts 16, 25. And by the way, those prisons weren't very nice back then. They're not real nice now, but they were really bad back then. Acts 16, 25. But at midnight, <coughs> Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. That in itself was testimony, wasn't it? You never know where you're going to be a testimony to God. You don't. That's why we shouldn't grumble anywhere. <laughs> you never know who's listening. Okay? So they prayed. And sing praises to God, a neighbor in prison. In spite of his difficult experiences in service for the Lord, what did Paul write about praise and rejoicing in the Lord? Well, these texts you're familiar with, Philippians 4.4, 4, very good one. They're all good. Get there. Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. Always. And it's so important he repeated it. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. rejoice in the Lord. Always. 1 Thessalonians 4. <laughs> 5. <laughs> right? 1 Thessalonians 5. 16. There he says it again, rejoice always. 17, pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean you're on your knees all the time, but you keep an attitude of prayer. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And like I say, many times that giving of thanks would be just pure faith. You, may, you know, you don't see why it's how it's good. And, but you do have the promise, all things work together for good. For those who love God, call according to His purpose. So you just rest in those promises. <laughs> Always rejoice in the Lord, and all things give thanks. What spiritual experience did Paul receive shortly after his conversion? Acts 9, 17. Very, very important experience. He was converted on the road to Damascus. Because he said in verse 6 of Acts 9, so he trembled and as, uh, astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? So he was convicted, he was converted, asking the Lord, what do you want me to do? 
and the Lord sent him to a certain place to pray. And then God told Ananias to go see him, <clears throat> which was an interesting request for Ananias to receive. And then you notice verse 17. Ananias went his way, he entered the house, laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you hear me talk about that a lot, right? That is the second most important experience in our walk with the Lord. First is conversion. Number one, born again. Number two, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, in this case, Paul wasn't even baptized in water yet. That came later. So the requirement to be baptized with the Spirit is to be born again. And then once we're born again, God says, okay, I want to fill you with my presence of the Holy Spirit. What counsel did, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> what counsel should be done as Paul give concerning the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Ephesians 5.18. Were you going to give me a glass of water? Yes. Good. Does somebody have the key back there to get in there to get a glass? <laughs> Looks like Vaughn has one. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> you may help. I should have brought some more. <clears throat> I'm talking too much. <laughs> Preachers do that, right? Okay. What did he say about the... Uh, Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. Do not be drunk with wine, and which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And the word be filled is a continuous action verb. Find a place to put this for those. Continuous action verb. Yeah, good. Um, I mean, that one like two, so. Yeah, both by the computer. <laughs> okay. That'll make it. Maybe we'll put that one back here, just in case. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you know, Bob, when we have our our potlucks, <clears throat> Bob makes sure we all have water, and he always gives me two. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay, this is important. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a one-time experience. We need every day, and you've heard me say, whenever you wake up in the morning, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. And as you go through the day, as you think about it, fill me with your Spirit. And so it, it's very important. That's the only way we can, we can live the Christian life as God wants us to. What benefit do we receive through the daily infilling of the Spirit in relation to rejoicing in the Lord. Well, you get the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit, love, joy, peace. You can't very well praise God and be rejoicing if you don't have love and joy and peace. And where do you get love, joy, and peace? The fruit of the Spirit. And where do you get the fruit of the Spirit? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. See how it's connected? That's why we need that. Now we go to day 31. <clears throat> Anger in health. Anger in health. If there's one thing I've noticed in the world that really is increasing is anger. There's just so much anger in this world today. You know, shootings in schools and out of schools. 
road rage, you name it. Anger. Okay. <clears throat> what does Proverbs 16, 32 and Hebrews 12, 14 and 15 teach about anger? Let's go to the Hebrews one. <clears throat> Hebrews 12. He says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now that's pretty strong language. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many be defiled. So, pretty serious. Very serious. We do not want to let anger hang on. One who controls his or her anger is a strong person, strong Lord, who we are to follow peace with all men. Yeah. What did Ella White say about anger? Wicked anger is the same as swearing. It's a poison of Satan. And notice this. The love of God is not in an angry heart. That's pretty pointed, isn't it? Yeah. Now don't get discouraged if you find that you still have some anger in you over something. But by God's grace, you, you know, I've, I think we'll deal with it here, but again, you have a free will. Turn your mind from what's causing you to be angry and ask Jesus to give you his peace. <clears throat> That's how you overcome any temptation. So you don't want to get discouraged if you see it there, but ask the Lord for his victory. Is feeling angry about something a sin? No. No sin to feel anger. <clears throat> According to Ephesians, when does anger become a sin? Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Be angry. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. So when does anger become a sin? When you allow the anger to remain in our heart. Yeah. Don't let it stay there. It'll just destroy you in every way. Your emotional healing. This is the emotional healing. It destroys your emotions and physically and spiritually. And you notice what it says here, uh, nor give place to the devil. When we hang on to anger, we give Satan a right of passage in our life. Now, what it will begin as, as demonic oppression, not possession. But if the anger is hold, held on to long enough and it gets deep enough, it can actually lead to possession as well. So by God's grace, you want to let it go. Yes? Possibly unresolved issues in relationships that don't get solved turn to anger. Yes. So they, they, they can get worked out and then that anger can grow and grow if it doesn't get... That's right. Unresolved relationships, issues. Now, here's an important warning there. Maybe something happened between me and somebody. And I do my best to try to resolve it, but they're not interested in resolving it. Then I gotta let it go. Because I'm not responsible for what they do, but I do have to be responsible for what I do. And if I need to say I'm sorry, I need to do that. But other than that, then, right. So, that, cause that's one trap Satan will try to get us in. We keep trying and trying and trying and trying to resolve it, and sometimes it keeps stirring and stirring and stirring it, and it doesn't resolve it. Yeah, but we want to be sure we're no anger in our heart toward anyone. 
What are some of the negative physical results of holding on to anger? High blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, lower immune system, diabetes, pulmonary problems. <laughs> It's like you taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. It doesn't work. It won't affect them a bit, but it will affect you. Yeah, it all, it's not a good thing. What emotional problems can unresolved anger cause? Depression, sadness, fear, interfere with one's relationship with God. Some of you have heard some of my presentations on emotional healing and maybe you've seen some videos on um, when, when I have prayer with people about the emotional healing, physical healing um, I'll talk to them a little bit and sometimes I'll, I'll say you know is there any situation or any individual you think of that has hurt you and sometimes the people say no but they got the symptoms. They got depression, they got sadness, they got fear, they got anxiety, they got the symptoms. If you got the symptoms, you got the emotional wound. It's that simple. And I remember in one place, I had spoken at this particular church on a weekend, <clears throat> and we, I, the pastor and I had some folks come in for prayer. And this young man came in, and he had had these, you know, some pretty severe symptoms. And I asked him the question, and he said, no, I, you know, everything's been good, good parents, this, that. And this fellow, I think, was probably in his early 20s. And so I said, okay, well, we'll just kneel down and pray and ask the Lord to, you know, to guide. And then as we were kneeling, he says, well, you know, I was sexually abused in the past. Do you think that has anything to do with it? I said, yeah. Well, what's interesting, we had prayed before we had our general talk, and as we were starting to kneel, the Holy Spirit came in and brought it to his thinking. Uh, and God would do that. If we ask the Lord, and this is another whole presentation, I don't have time to get into it, but we can ask God to cast down the strongholds that's keeping us from really knowing he loves us, and us loving others and being emotionally healed, those strongholds are hurts, people that have hurt you. And you pray that prayer to cast down the strongholds, he will hear it, and in due time, he will bring to your mind experiences where you've been hurt. And then you want to go through the forgiveness there. I don't think we go through the prayer of forgiveness in this book. But when we do the one on, del on uh, deliverance and miracles after Labor Day, we will go through that prayer of forgiveness. And if you got my book, Spirit Baptism and Deliverance, it's in that. How does daily being filled with the Spirit help one let go of anger? Well, Christ lives in the believer most fully through the Baptist Holy Spirit. And it's only through Christ we can do that. How does Paul's experience described in Galatians 3.20 help unresolved resolve anger? Well, you know, this is a favorite text of mine. We'll read it. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, Christ lives in the believer most fully through the Baptist Holy Spirit. And so, when we're tempted, we allow Christ to give us his peace, his love, his joy, forgiveness. And that's how we can get rid of the anger. And we can forgive others. Is Christ doing it in us and through us? Okay, now the next one kind of fits in along the same theme. Yes? You know, this just came to my mind um, about forgiveness. That um, when it said that Satan came and he had, Jesus said that he had nothing in him, mm -hmm. he came and he has nothing in him. That's me. right. That Christ was always one that if something did come up, it must have been that he always 
prayed about it? Yes. Christ always right. Christ did not yield one and anything. And that, that point that when he was being nailed to the cross mm -hmm. and while it was happening he was saying, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That he was that instant yeah. in asking forgiveness for those other people. He was for, they right. talk about we have to forgive those other people. Yes. And he was so instant in doing that. Um, that's where God wants to take us. I would love to be he, in that place. That's, that's where it's a growth process. He, God wants to take us where we instantly will forgive. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into that a little more on this. And where it says, Christ said, uh, you know, Satan had nothing in him. Those who are ready to meet Jesus, they'll be in the same situation. Satan will have nothing in them. Why? Because it's all Christ in them. And the sinful nature has been subdued. It's still there. But it's not controlling them in any way. Okay. Well, over here, what does the Bible teach about the importance of forgiving others? Here's a text we probably all know, but it's an important one to review again. Uh, Mark 11, 25 to 26. Pretty straight talk from Jesus. Mark 11, 25 and 26. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. That's pretty clear, isn't it? So forgiveness leads to physical and spiritual, unforgiveness leads to physical and spiritual problems. It will affect our relationship with God, our relationship with others. No happiness with unforgiveness. If we refuse to forgive others, what are the consequences of our relationship with God and our eternal destiny? And we read that earlier. One who hopes unto unforgiveness is not forgiven by God and will be lost. That's pretty strong language. But it's what he says. Now again, God remembers where we're at. He looks at the heart. We may want to be a forgiving person in our heart, but we've not grown to that point to be able to do that yet. God understands that, and he will lead us to get there. Okay? That's why I'm so glad God's a judge, not me. We, we see the outward. God looks at the heart. He knows what's there. But I guarantee you, those who are ready to meet Jesus, there will be no unforgiveness whatsoever in their heart. There will be no anger or bitterness in their heart. They've gotten the victory there. It's Christ, 100%. What are some of the physical consequences of unforgiving attitude? Tense muscles, high blood pressure, increased stress. It's just like anger. Anger and unforgiveness go together. So you got the same type of consequences. You know, when God counsels us over and over to forgive, it's for our good. It's not maybe necessarily for the other person. They may not accept our forgiveness. But it's for us that he counsels us to forgive. It's for our blessing. What benefits of forgiveness did a study on personality and social psychology bulletin point out? Forgiveness restores negative relationships affects one's attitude toward others, enhances other social relationships. If a person is angry and unforgiving, it's going to affect every relationship they got in life. And they're going to be easily made angry again. Because it's right there. It's kind of on the surface seething. And it doesn't take too much to set them off. We've all known people like that. Kind of like you've heard the expression, they wear their feelings on their shirt sleeves. All you got to do is, you know, are you walk around on eggshells around them? Okay, that's that kind of person. They're just anger inside. And you, you can set them off so easy. <clears throat> so it affects their relationships with others. What has our pride 
what should be does our pride have to do with our willingness to forgive or not forgive? It is self-love. This comes from a quote from Ellen White. It is self-love and pride that causes one to hang on to unforgiveness. That's important to remember. When we get angry over some selfish issue, you know, something concerning us, I'm not talking about righteous indignation. When you see some atrocity on the news and you just feel, oh, it's terrible. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when someone says something or does something and you feel anger, that is your pride. Your pride has been wounded. Self love. Why do you get angry when somebody cuts you off driving? They took your rights. Because they're dumb. They're dumb. <laughs> if I'm coming real fast, they might be dumb. They might get hit. But it's because my rights, they violated my rights. See, that's pride. That's self. If by God's grace, that pride starts doing, being subsiding, and God's love and patience comes up, we can come to the point that they cut us off, we just simply slow down. And we feel no negative feelings at all. God will get us there. That's what he wants to do. <laughs> there is hope, Melody. <laughs> and he's going to get us there. But you know, that's where, I guess, like, if you can put it together, we must be enlightened by the word to know it's wrong. If we're not enlightened by the word knowing it's wrong, we think it's okay to get angry if someone cuts me off. So see, that's where being enlightened by the word through the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit will come in and fulfill the word in us. So we become patient and so forth. How did Ella White describe what the Christian reaction should be to personal verbal attacks? We will be deaf to reproach and blind to scorn and insult. Wow. That's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? Wouldn't that be great? I mean, I'm still growing in this. Wouldn't that be great? That no matter what anybody says to you, it does not affect you negatively. That'd be a good deal. Now, all of us are going to feel a little sting of criticism. But, what we need to do, you may feel it, but then back off. And then ask yourself the question, is there any validity to it? Maybe there is. And accept it. And sometimes God will use someone to bring something to you that maybe you don't like them. But God chose to use them to bring something to you. So always look at it in balance. Say, okay, now wait a minute. Is God trying to say something? But if it's not, then you can just let it go, too. So, yeah. Um, I think the beginning of her uh, um, quote here, um, it's because we are so lost in Christ that yes. we do not take the That's right. That That's, place the more us. filled we are with the Spirit, the more we have Christ living in us. So it's not that we have a self-control issue no. where we can go, okay, that's not going to hurt me. I'm not no. going to let that hurt me. It's Christ. It's because we're so filled with Christ that's right. that it's just not even an option. That's right. That's why the Baptist Holy Spirit is essential. It's through the Baptist Holy Spirit Christ lives in us most fully. And like Paul said, I'm praying for you till Christ be formed in you. Mm -hmm. It's a process. So we get more and more and more of Christ and less and less of self. And we come to the point, it is Christ. And, and we reach this point. What does love have to do with forgiving others? The more love we have in our heart, the more forgiving we'll be of others. That's, and when it goes together. Why is the baptism of the Holy Spirit necessary for one to be truly loving? Well, Romans 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. So it's only through the baptism of the Holy Spirit that God's love is in our heart. That's why I say, being born again in the baptism of the Spirit, those are the two essential experiences.
Put in your own words, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. You, you're familiar with that text. It's talking about love, defines love. A loving Christian will not demand their own way, will not be sensitive when others say or do something offensive to them. Yeah. Who comes back? That's where God wants to take us individually and as a congregation. And I and I want to, you know, I'm very, I praise God for where we're at. God is blessing us. We're all growing, but God is blessing us. And, and I think every one of us want to become this kind of Christian. And I'll tell you this, the more we become Christ-like, that's what this is, the more safe we will be for people to come. They won't be judged. They'll, they'll be able to come, worship, be part of our church family, and grow in Christ at their own rate. That's, that's the kind of congregation and church we want to be. And, and I feel positive. I, I think God is working to get us there. So that's, that's a blessing. When, uh, let's see, when the Christian is tempted to be unforgiving, what should he or she do? Turn the mind away from what had tempted them. Be unforgiving. Ask Christ to give them His forgiveness. That's the difference. His forgiveness. Going back to Galatians 2.20. Do you think those ready to meet Jesus will be angry and unforgiving toward anyone? No. Those ready for Christ's second coming will not be angry or unforgiving because Christ will be living out His life in them. Okay. Next lesson, stress, fear, and then we get into the last generation, the generation ones. Okay, uh, we want to have prayer, and uh, do we have a drawing today? Yes, we do. We do. Okay, let's have prayer, and then we have a drawing. Father, we thank you for the time we've had to study your word, Lord, and, and Lord, we thank you for your counsels. We thank you for the promise of your spirit to fulfill the counsels of your word in our life. And what we've studied today, we truly want to be like Jesus. We wouldn't be here if we didn't. And we just ask you to continue to work in our life day by day that Christ will be seen in us more and more. Amen. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.